In case you wonder what's going on here, this is yours truly in Chiapas, Mexico in January 1953. I'm in jungle training camp getting ready to go, well, I wasn't sure where, and that's why I was in camp along with uh, many, many other uh, Wycliffe recruits ready to go somewhere to do Bible translation, and uh, they were trying to prepare us for anything, anytime. Now, this thing is what I slept in for the last six weeks of the 12-week period that I was in Chiapas. Now, right here, you see Helen, my partner, in uh, jungle camp in her Sunday dress, because we did dress up on Sundays, in the champa, oh, I should say shelter, that we made from jungle materials. And she is cooking at a fire table that we made so we would know how to do something like that, uh, building a fire up high so we didn't have to bend over to use it. Well, here we are mudding a hut. I'm not in this picture. I helped to stomp the mud. But this is the finished hut that we made by spreading mud over some poles. This is Helen on one of our uh, longer hikes. When we went on these very, very long hikes, they took along a mule or two that some of the girls could ride on. And I don't think they ever let the fellows ride unless they had a sprained ankle or something like that. And now here we are. Oh, I'm on a two-day hike here, and this is at a rest stop we had at a rancher's place, and this is Helen at the same ranch, but she picked a prettier spot than I did to have her picture taken. After the rest stop, the whole bunch started out again, straggling out across the uh, prairie there, and uh, I think maybe this is me over here at the far right. I wasn't the very end of the troop, though I insist. And now here are the girls in the river learning to build a raft if necessary because we knew that some of us were going to end up in South America, America in the Amazon Valley. There are some fellows over there building their own raft, but the girls had to do theirs. We didn't have them to be our servants. Finally, I got to uh, Guatemala, to the town where I was supposed to be uh, working for the next several years. This is August of 1953. That first one was in, first part was in January. And this is looking down on the town. This is Cabulco from that hilltop where I was. This is the town where I spent my time for the next many, many years doing Bible translation, and Helen was doing nursing work. And this is Main Street of Cabulco. Standing right in front of our house, this is it, this white on the left. That's where we lived. And looking down toward the Catholic Church at the other end of town. And then the market was just next door to the Catholic Church. And there it is on a Sunday. Yes, market was on Sunday. Here's a young lady uh, that we met on the road, just a little bit shy, but just a little darling. This is a couple of birds. Yeah, the, the green one is our landlady's parrot. Helen and I rented a room from a Spanish family in town, and these are a couple of little Indian kids that used to like to come and visit us. We uh, showed them how to use books and began teaching them something about letters, how to read and write, hopefully sometime that they would be literate. And this is a neighbor family who lived not uh, more than, well, what would be like a couple of blocks, U.S. blocks from us. And the uh, old gentleman there in the middle was such a good picture study. We've got a good close-up of, of him in just a minute here. And I wanted you to get to know him because though he was a town drunk for a while, after he had seen how the Lord worked in the lives of his wife and his uh, son, he became a Christian, and people used to say, Oh, whatever happened to you? You're so different now. He was a sweet guy. This is probably the first child that I tried to teach how to read. He was the son of a lady who came to do uh, housework for us, uh, half a day, most of the days of the week. 
and another little girl. This is <laughs> unusual because little girls weren't allowed to come hanging around our place very much. But this one did love to come, and she, she loved to be inside the house because we had so many interesting things there. And then these little boys. These are a couple of little brothers who lived not too far from us. The one uh, on the right is Bartolo, and on the left, the one whom I'm helping, is Juanito, his little brother. I want you to keep the name Bartolo in mind. Now here's Bartolo again. He's the one in the green shirt there in the chair. Juanito is over there on the left, his face very much in the shadow because of his hat. I mean, most of those kids didn't want to take their hats off. And the other little boy was named Santos, and here he is hanging around, and he was such a bright little guy. I taught him to read and write, and he was able then to go to school, and he never flunked a grade, which was unusual. Here's Santos again out in front, Bartolo in the back row, and uh, these are just my little, my little urchins that love to hang around. I thought this was lying on its side. No, but it's just the kid that's lying on his side. The other kids are playing their bamboo whistles. By the way, if you ever heard about have to wet your whistle, if your bamboo whistle gets all dried out, you have to stick it in a bucket of water so that you can really play a tune on it. They could. They did play tunes on those whistles. Besides teaching little boys how to read, I tried to teach older people, too, who came around. Uh, this old fellow uh, was uh, one who liked to come and visit us, and I loved uh, starting to teach him to read. He didn't get to come long enough to really learn. But here's a lady who did learn and used the uh, teaching that I gave her as she became more and more uh, engrossed in the Christian faith and how she grew. Besides her, here's another lady who is showing me Yes, I can read this. I can pronounce this. I know what that is. And at the bottom of li the list is E Ali. That means the girl. And E Ala, that's the boy. She can read that. And this is a scene in the Nazarene church on uh, Sunday afternoon when they weren't having services. Those who were uh, wanting to learn to read, I would go there and uh, uh, teach them as I could. Here's Helen, my nurse partner, receiving a patient who has been brought down from the hills, carried on a chair on somebody's back, who knows for how many hours. More than once we had terribly ill patients brought down to our clinic that way. And this is the inside of the clinic. I didn't mention that eventually we did have a separate clinic built from our house, and that's what this is. This is an the clinic, the scene when this clinic was nice and new. And these youngsters, bless their little hearts, sicker probably than we could even imagine. Here she is making use of our uh, homemade exam table. And those drawers, though, there are full of medicines. This one is uh, just a, another patient getting her heart or lungs examined. And here, slung on her mother's back, there's a little baby being brought to the clinic for Helen to diagnose and treat. I guess I don't need to explain what's going on there. I think you can figure that one out. But wearing a straw hat? I don't know that I have any comment about these. They're just nice to look at. Now, I told you to remember the name Bartolo. Here is Bartolo, who became a preacher after I had learned, uh, <laughs> after I'd learned him to read. Uh, he went on to school and Bible school and was assigned to uh, the area not too far from us as a Nazarene preacher. One day, this little guy came after Helen and asked her to please go see his sick grandmother. This little bitty short legged fellow was so cute and so sharp, so smart. He wasn't afraid. He came quite a distance and got Helen to go see his poor sick grandmother. 
Now I want you to think of John Wycliffe when you see this. John Wycliffe didn't have electricity when he was doing uh, Bible translation. And at nights when I studied, there were times when we didn't have electricity either. And there I am burning the midnight oil. Don't you feel, imp aren't you impressed? I wanted you to be. At this point, I'm doing some checking of translation that we've already uh, produced with another uh, person. And this young man is a boy who also, after became Christian, I taught him to read. And he too went on to school, became a preacher. And there he was helping me translate. This is Andres, my main uh, translation helper, as we were working. This is the way we worked most of the time with him sitting there and we were discussing the passage and he would finally decide, well, the best way to say it is like this. When we got a certain uh, amount of translation done, we would have a Bible class. Well, I should say, we had weekly Bible classes in our house. We invited the Indian friends to come to our house knowing that many of our neighbors would not really want to go to a Protestant church, but they would come to our place, and we would have a Bible class. Andres is leading it here, and we usually had refreshments, and that helped. This old fellow is one who came to visit us once when Helen was sick, and while we were sitting chatting with Helen, we showed him, yes, look here, your language can be printed, and it can just come right off of this page, and I was reading a part of, I think, the Gospel of John to him. These are four ladies, Achi ladies, who have become Christians. Uh, the way they say it is they set their hearts down in Christ. Isn't that nice? That's for faith, to set your heart down in him. And these are some more people that, uh, these are families now, at a Christmas party. This was 1966. We'd had a Christmas program at the church. By this time, there were uh, many Christians. And uh, after the Christmas program at church, then we went out to uh, have a, a party where we ate tamales at midnight. The young man in the uh, back row there with the necktie on is that one who was helping me do that translation check. He also became a preacher assigned to our town and that's why he's wearing a necktie and a suit coat. We have another one or two, I think, of this time. Oh, yeah, this is a Sunday school teacher. He's uh, at the uh, Christmas party, too, with a lot of the kids that are in his class. And kids are kids the world over and took a certain amount of control. Here, uh, this family, these two uh, young men are playing their homemade flutes. I'm not sure that there's that they're uh, bamboo. I guess they're not. Maybe they're, uh, you figure them out. After we had done the uh, translation, the time came for us to have the dedication of the New Testament. That was a time that we had worked hard for, and here we are about to dedicate the New Testament in a uh, formal um, presentation for the town. This is in... Um, uh, 1984, and we didn't want it just to be a, a church celebration. We had it in uh, the uh, city, <laughs> city hall that had been blasted to pieces by guerrillas, and all that was left was this concrete floor and a tin roof, but we had our celebration there anyway. And this uh, youngster on Mama's back, I think, insisted on coming because he probably wanted a New Testament of his very own. This is part of the group that was there. We had about 500 people under that tin roof that day, and many of them were Christians. Many others were not Christians but were interested. It was just something special going on in town, and they'd come to see what it was. Oh, we had the governor there to speak. And here at the... Uh, microphone now. Helen is reading a portion of the New Testament. The man in the middle is the director of our mission who came out uh, to help us celebrate at that time. And he handed her the Bible and said, here, you read 
I've forgotten what the passage was. Then after she finished, he handed it to me and said, now you read some. He had something else picked out for me. And when I finished, I said to the crowd who was gathered, now you've heard that God talks your language. This is his word in your own language. At that point, I also gave credit to those who had helped us through the years to make the translation a possibility and giving thanks for those who uh, had worked with us when they weren't at all sure that it was a good idea. At this point, I'm presenting uh, Mingo with his own personal copy, and over to the left is uh, Mariano, who has already received his. This lady is the pastor of the Assembly of God Church. By this time, there were two Protestant churches in town, and the Catholic Church was going quite well, which was not the way it was when we went in 1953. By now, remember, we're in 1984, and the pastor of the two pastors of the two Protestant churches participated with uh, encouraging remarks in the presentation of the New Testament. At the podium now is the Catholic priest who was. Uh, kind enough to come and also uh, promote the use of the New Testament in the Indian language. And at this point, he's offering a dedicatory prayer, uh, asking God to bless it and help people to make good use of it. As soon as that was over, people gathered around the various uh, stalls or corners of the pavilion where we were so that they could choose their New Testament and take one home with them. And now we see some of them enjoying just leafing through the books as they get them. This young man has a, had a broken back for years and years. Of course, he's in a wheelchair. And he's a sweet Christian, had been for about uh, three or four years. And he was dying to get his own New Testament in his own language. He's reading aloud there. These fellows came from Pachahope, which is a hill uh, which is a, a village way, way up in the hills from us. It's six hours away. And this guy, I don't know how far he had to come, but he was glad to sit down with that foot. This girl had tried to buy one the day before, or, or at the time of the dedication, but she didn't have the money. So she came to our house the next day, bought a new New Testament, and that's she, what she has in her basket there. A girl doesn't carry something just in her hand. You always put it in a basket. At that point, I said to Helen, well, it's all over. Now we can relax. We can sit back and take it easy. And Helen said, are you kidding? <laughs> now we're going to build that hospital. And I said, you've got to be kidding. But no. Look here. Six months later, this is what's going on. Here she is. Yes, I, I told her every reason why we couldn't. She didn't even listen. She just went and talked to the Lord about it. And the Lord sent help and helpers and people worked. Here she is now watching uh, some of the fellows mixing cement. And she gets kind of concerned about this young kid that's here. He's, he's not one of the laborers, but he loved to hang around. And he's not the only one. They loved to be there participating as they could. And she's saying to him, are you sure you shouldn't be in school? And he says, I went to school this morning. Well, okay. And she lets him go ahead, glad that uh, and he's glad to help. Everybody is paying attention. Notice the big grin on the face of the fellow who is working with him. And then in the summer of 1986, here we had a lot of help coming from the states, volunteers coming in recruited and organized by Wycliffe Associates. And they've come out to help us all during the summer of 86. We had crews coming down, some being there for only maybe a week, some for two weeks, and some who were uh, directing things being there for as much as three months. This happens to be the pastor of an evangelical free church in Burbank, California. He's there with a crew from that church helping us. See, ugh, that's the one putting our 
slabs of roofing in place on the hospital. We were glad for their help. Eventually, it was finished up, and now here we have the front of the hospital in, uh, let's see, this would be March of uh, 1990. I failed to mention that all during the time that those other people were there in, 60, in 86, Helen was sick. She had Hodgkin's disease and couldn't get uh, an accurate diagnosis for it. We came home in, 60, in, in 86, October, and until 87. And then we went back to Guatemala. But she died in January of 1990 before the hospital was quite finished. And I was terrified and sick in more ways than one. But the Lord had somebody ready to step in and help us finish it up. And here we are with the new hospital finished, equipped, and ready to go and being dedicated. As I was recalling to the people there, friends of Helen's, who knew her so well, how her vision had been for the help for the, for the village and for the whole area. I said, well, we're sorry that Helen cannot be here. She cannot see what we're seeing today, but I want you to know as I know that she's here in spirit. And then I reached up and unveiled the portrait that we have of her up over the door. In fact, the hospital is named La Senorita Elena, named for Helen, whose heart was in it. Here we see Bob McRae, the director of the mission that took over the hospital when it wasn't quite finished, wasn't furnished, not, not totally furnished, as Bob is speaking to, to the people of uh, the town and the whole area of what it means to serve Christ and why they're there. After that, they got to look around a little bit. And here we can see them uh, milling around the hospital, looking at the lovely tiled walls and, and how nice and clean and pretty everything is. So it was a great day, that day in March of 1990. And here it is. The Christian, let's see, that Centro Medico Cristiano, La Senorita Elena. The Christian Medical Center, the Miss Helen. That's the crowd looking on from the street as the dedication was being finished. 